At 14, Jeff set a Rubik's Cube record of 24.67 seconds and then wrote a book titled Conquer the Cube that detailed his method. Uh, he then worked as a software engineer and moved to Atlanta, but as a Bronx native, uh, he was so unsatisfied with the local pizza that he decided to fix it. This meant hosting pizza tastings at his home, uh, publishing what's known as the Internet's number one pizza recipe, and finally opening Verrazano's Pizzeria earlier this year. Please welcome Jeff Verrazano. Hey. <laughs> How you doing, guys? Um, thanks for having me, first of all. I haven't given a PowerPoint presentation in a long time, so you're going to have to uh, bear with me a little bit. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, you know, when, when I had the opportunity, when Mike called and, 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 and asked me to speak here, you know, I originally was going to talk just about the food, and I'll just give you a little bit of background on the, on the pizzeria. But then I did want to tie it into some of the other things that I've done and, and just kind of show how they all relate to one another. Uh, when I moved, I moved down to Atlanta, I guess, uh, in early 98, so about 11 years ago. And uh, like a lot of people that are from the Northeast, I was suffering from some serious pizza withdrawal, and just withdrawal of a lot of food in general. I, I think the, the pastries, the cannolis, the, even the hot dogs, even the papaya king hot dogs, the bagels. And I just started to uh, make these things uh, um, in my home, or at least the pizza I started to make at home. And um, I, I guess I carried it to a little bit more of an extreme than I than I intended to. I, I started to go to all the top New York pizzerias every time I was back in New York. I hit Patsy's and Lombardi's and all these old school pizzerias. And I noticed that they all bake their pizzas very, very hot. And so I um, uh, I started to tinker with my oven and eventually kind of jerry-rigged it a little bit so I could run on the cleaning cycle. On the cleaning cycle, a lot of people don't know, your oven will hit 1,000 degrees. So it's, you have a little, you have a cleaning cycle, you have a, the makings of a of a pretty good coal-fired pizza oven right in your house if you're willing to void the warranty and uh, risk burning your house down. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I just started to uh, experiment. At first, first, I was just using the basic generic recipes, and then I started to experiment with all different kinds of flour and all different kinds of cheeses and all different kinds of sauces. And you know, gradually, my pizza got better and better. And as it did, I started to notice that there were a lot of similarities uh, between learning uh, how to do the pizza and the software projects that I was working on, and even the Rubik's Cube. So, uh, and really learning anything. So that's really the topic that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, today. Um, eventually, I put up a, a website on how to make pizza, really just at the request of one person. Somebody said, you know, what's your recipe? And I just threw up this website in just one day. And it, 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 it became a little cult website where people who were really into pizza around the internet knew about it. And then about a year later, it just went viral and became one of these things that just got passed around the internet and you know, slammed my servers and brought, brought my servers down because of the traffic on this one day. got picked up on, on CNET as a news story. And eventually on fart.com and boingboing.net is one of these just little strange stories that floats around. And then I started having people say, you know, you should open up a pizzeria or you should help me open up my pizzeria. I probably had about 40 people um, asked me if I could help them open their pizzeria. One of my favorite emails of all time. I've, I've had about 2,400 people write me letters uh, from the website. And uh, my favorite letter of all time is, you come China, make pizza for profit. So, that, <laughs> so that's when I knew that it might be a good time to open up uh, my own pizzeria. And uh, that's what I did. And we just opened up a few months ago. And we were just voted best pizzeria in Atlanta by Jezebel Magazine. And uh, we had a lot of people that come in and say it's the best pizza they've ever had. So hopefully some of you guys will get a chance to try it at some point. But let me get back on the topic here. So what does learning about pizza software and Rubik's Cube have in common? Well, actually, mastering any skill shares a lot in common. So it doesn't really matter what you're trying to master. If you're trying to master golf, if you're trying to master the trumpet, if you're trying to master improv comedy um, of the Rubik's Cube pizza software, there are a lot of things that, uh, that, that are in common to, to learning any sort of a skill. I just threw up a gratuitous picture from pizza over here. Uh, um, one thing is that it, it, it takes a long time to master anything, and it's not a simple process. It's not something where you just get uh, an insight one day, and then you can, and then you can, uh, you know, have some sort of massive improvement. What you see instead is you see this sort of a sort of a jumpstart cycle. So in the in, in the first step, you 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 take what you already know and you begin to improve on it a little bit, and then you hit a point of diminishing returns. I call this stress, but one way to think about it is you hit a point of diminishing returns. And at that point of diminishing returns, you realize you you have to really maybe even back up and, and, and challenge your own assumptions about where you are. And at that point, 
if you're lucky, you'll have some sort of a breakthrough where you see a new way of doing things. And you'll jump up, but you won't stay up there. You'll, you'll realize that there's, um, that the new thing, the new trick that you learned may not be compatible with, you may have improved one technique, but it may not be compatible with all the other techniques. I mean, an example that I give is, you know, we were all on, on horse and buggy for a while. And then we realized, you know, that wasn't going to, that wasn't going to work. So now we discover the, uh, the car. And we have a big jump up. But now we realize we don't really have the infrastructure for that. We don't have gasoline stations every mile. We have, we have, we have feed stations every mile. So there's kind of a retrenchment while the, while you reorganize either yourself personally or whether the culture has to reorganize around uh, the new way of thinking. And there's a little bit of a retrenchment. And then you begin again until that kind of wears out, until you can make more and more improvements until whatever, whatever that breakthrough is hits its point of diminishing returns. Almost anything that you do has some sort of a diminishing returns. I, I used to notice when I did software that customers would want all these different features. And a lot of programmers would just pile on feature after feature. I, I programmed a lot of verticals. So accounting systems, invo you know, inventory, that sort of stuff. And, and people would just add more features. We need this report and that report and you know, this, other, this other tool. But what would happen is the programs themselves would just kind of sort of die of their own weight. So as the features increased, for a while there would be an improvement. But then after a while it would hit a point of diminishing returns. And no one could even find the report they had anymore, buried among all the other features. And you'd have 10 reports that were designed for one person who doesn't even work here anymore. And it just cluttered the whole system. And people end up consolidating around a small number of things that they actually do use. And the, and the whole system is actually functioning at a, at a fraction of its, of, it, of its potential. So pretty much anything you do is going gonna, is gonna to hit a point of diminishing returns. And at that point, you have to reorganize yourself. OK. I want to talk a little bit. This is the main thing that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the stages of mastery. So in addition to having kind of a time sequence to it, there are, there's a certain look. There are certain stages that, it, that, that mastering anything goes through. And the first stage is what I call randomly connected. So what do I mean by that? It means you just kind of, sort of start where you are. So let's say that I wanted to learn how to, how to play golf. So you know, I just you know, I don't really know how to play golf. So I just put the ball down and I just kind of sort of, you know, I just hack away at it. And however my swing is, is probably randomly connected to something else that I learned. So maybe I learned baseball when I was a kid. And that's kind of the random uh, bit of learning that I take into this, in, take into this process. Um, at this point in time, I don't necessarily even know all the, all the different parts or aspects of, of golf. I don't understand. And I'm going to learn at the next step when I begin to separate out all the different techniques, I'm going to learn, well, there's a certain way you hold the ball. There's a, you know, there's a certain way you hold the club, rather. There's a certain way you hold your arms. There's a certain way that your hip swings. And you begin to learn all these different techniques. And the majority of your time learning a skill is spent, essentially, in this stage here, <coughs> which is technique building, where you're separating out the task that you're learning into finer and finer and finer subtasks. Um, um, the, the problem is, at this stage, if, if you don't get help, if you don't see the next stage, and some people don't. You know, I, I, I compare this to almost every area of your life you can see this. You can see people on the Jerry Springer show, where they don't understand their finances, for example. And, um, and their finances are you know, kind of sort of random, randomly connected to, you know, they're, they're doing their books the way their, their mother did their books, which you know, is, has nothing to do with, 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 with getting them a financial success. And so they feel hopeless, and they're poor. And so you can, you can almost see it. You could almost see it in, in any stage. And so what you want to do with that person, first thing is say, OK, well, you, know, you have your credit cards. You have your checks. You have your ins. You have your income. You have your budget. You, you begin to separate and divide things out. And this is the first stage at which you have any sort of power. Where This is kind of sort of it has you. And at this stage, you begin to kind of have it. Um, the problem at this stage, and you, you spend a long time at this stage, is that um, it's frustrating because what works one day what seems to work one day doesn't work the next. I mean, anyone who's ever played golf, it, it, it's, it's a great example. You, you learn a new technique. So now you've got this new stand that the guy taught you. you know? And so now you go out there, and you hit it, and you, you have a great day. You're like, I got this. And then the next day you go out, and you're, you're terrible again. And it's because you don't really have control over it. Um, and so it's very, very technique-based, and nothing looks smooth, and nothing is smooth. Um, and the next stage. Things are reconnected. So you have all the different tools that you've learned. And now you begin to 
to reconnect them. So maybe if you're doing improv, maybe if you want to be a comedian, at this stage you're learning different voices. At this stage you're learning different inflections. You're learning different accents. You're learning timing. And at this stage where you can, is where you can combine them all. And it is at this stage that you, ex you, you see people begin to be able to improvise something. I saw this amazing video that I highly recommend anybody looking up. It was Robin Williams um, on Inside the Actors Studio. And he did this little improv number, uh, and it's on YouTube. He did this little improv number with a woman in the audience, and she had a, uh, a scarf. So he just picked up the scarf, and he did like eight routines with the scarf, you know? He put it around his waist, and he was, did a Japanese accent, and he was Iron Chef, you know? He put it around his head, and he was, was like, you know, he was, you know, he was a Muslim woman. And he, he had the, 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 the thing had these little fringes, and he went through it like he was the car wash. I mean, he just had all this stuff, like, right at his fingertips, like, boom, 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 boom. And he, he was changing his voice tone. He was changing the accent and the characters that he was in. And it was just one thing after another, and really an, an exhibition of mastery. And he makes it look easy. And that's what you see at this stage. Things look easy because you can pull from whatever is coming at you. You, you have the ability not only to have the techniques, but to control them um, and to constantly correct yourself. So if Tiger Woods, for example, is swinging a golf club, you know, if I'm swinging a golf club and I was taught how to bring the club down, if I make a mistake at that point, you know, at, at the beginning point in time, um, well, it's pretty much over for me. You know, it's, it, that's it. It's gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna slice it. Um, but if, if when Tiger swings, he probably in his mind has the, just the beginning part of that, that swing divided into ten stages in his head. And if he makes a mistake at the first stage, you know, he, he then thinks and says, well, I'm gonna make this change, and then he'll make this change. And he has, he might have five opportunities to make an, make an adjustment, and you know, whoosh, it goes, and it looks like a perfect shot. Um, we don't have the ability to do that. You know, when you see Jordan going to the hoop, you don't see him like counting steps or anything. It just everybody makes it look easy once they've reached that stage because they can take all these disparate parts and connect them back together. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we see this all over. We see this, and I've given the examples of of, of performance. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to I'm going to relate it largely to 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 programming. So I'm going to give some slides in a minute where I talk about. The difference between code that's randomly connected, I, I used to do a lot of uh, 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 vertical applications, data applications, and a lot of these were programmed in the, in the 80s and 90s, and they were trying to improve them. And a lot of the code was just pretty random code that was just coded by lots of different people who weren't even necessarily using the same tools, and they were trying to glue all these things back together. And I'm going to show a diagram in a minute to talk about the Frankenstein model. And then we evolved those into toolkits, and then I'm going to talk about framework. So I'm going to come back to that one a little bit. Um, and you can kind of sort of just see, and this might be a chart to kind of, I don't want to go over the whole thing, but you can, you know, maybe look at this uh, at a later time on the video, and you can just see how different things in life all fit into the same pattern. It can be a simple thing as, you know, I want to clean my room. So the first thing is I just divide everything into piles. I just separate them into piles. Then I have to decide, you know, where are they, how are they going to connect? You know, the stapler should sit right next to the, uh, to the copier. I mean, just organizing things has this sort of, a, has this sort of a characteristic. Um, you see the same thing. Um, if any of you have ever read um, Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talks about this. He says the first stage of getting control of your life is uh, you start off, you're, de you're dependent. You're dependent on all of your history in the past and all the, all the assumptions you made as a child and your upbringing. So the next stage is to become independent of all of that, is to, is to take control of your, your mental state. Um, but then the next stage, I think, surprised a lot of people because a lot of people thought he was going to say that the last stage is, you know, now you're totally independent. Now you've you've extricated yourself and you're totally in control uh, of what of what you have of, of of who you are. But actually, he talked about becoming interdependent was was the final and seventh habit. So you can see it's very much the same thing of what I'm of what I'm talking about. Let me give a concrete example. Oh, actually, let me let me go over this little chart here. So, how does knowing any of this help? You? How does knowing any of this help? Well, for starters, you know what to expect. Okay, first of all, it takes a long time to master anything. A lot of people think, oh, if I just learn this one thing, then I will, I will, uh, I will be able to achieve something. And it, it's almost never like that. Someone just wrote a book that says it takes, you know, 10,000 hours. To, to get good at something. And I, it's funny, I found it very funny because I've always been saying that it takes 2,000 hours to start 
and then a lifetime to and a lifetime to really master anything that you want to get good at. So no matter how it doesn't really matter what it is. If you want to shoot free throws, you know, stay in there for 2,000 hours and shoot free throws, and eventually, you know, you'll be you'll be as good as anyone in your high school at shooting free throws. Now, if you want to be, you know. Michael Jordan, that might be good enough to be Shaq, but if you, <laughs> if you want to be Michael Jordan, you might have to be 10,000 hours or more uh, with it. So a lot of times, w w this helps because sometimes you're presented with an opportunity and you, you have to make a realistic assessment of whether you're going to go for it. And I know, I, I make a decision of if I'm really going to commit to it or not. So someone recently said to me, you know, Jeff, I want to teach you how to be a pilot. He was all gung-ho. He's like, you, you would make a great pilot. And I was like, I don't know if I have 2,000 hours to <laughs> devote to that right now, so I, you know, I really don't want to start because I know I'm not going to finish it. Um, the next thing you know is that you know that there's a cycle to it, so you kind of can see what stage you're in. You know, you 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 can be on the lookout for a breakthrough. You can be on the lookout for separating things into different techniques, um, and you can be on you can be looking for how to make finer and finer distinctions. You know, I talk to 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 people in the pizza business all the time, and most of them, you know, they just have a very simple recipe. So you know. They, they, some people put oregano in their sauce. Well, I've sampled 28 oreganos in the last in the last three months because I have breaking that down to finer and finer distinctions, um, and um, and I know to do that because of these principles. Somebody analyzed patents. Somebody went to the patent office and got a thousand patents and just kind of read through them all. And what he noticed was that almost all the patents have to do with taking something and breaking it into parts. So it could be that you have a tire. And the tire has one big air hole in it. So of course, if it gets one, one, one cut in it, the whole thing collapses. But if you divide it into thousands of air holes, if you make it into a foam, for example, on the inside, then it can withstand a puncture. So, um, so pretty much whether it's, a, whether it's a logical breaking things down in parts or a physical breaking things down in parts, you see that same thing over and over again. Uh, most things uh, are broken into pieces. Um, the next thing is it can help you because you can look for breakthrough by examining the stress points. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit more when I talk about the software. Okay. You can get a glimpse of what the final stage is like, and this may help you get there faster. So definitely going to talk about this as I go through. The, I'll definitely talk about this as I go through the software. Um, when when I first started to deal with these vertical systems, there's a natural tendency to want to break the thing into, into parts. And you would find that there were all these different toolkits that help you do a task. But very early on, I realized that unless those are all recombined, so that separation is not the end. It's really the middle stage. And unless there's a way to recombine those into something more powerful, into some sort of a framework, that that can't possibly be the answer. That can't possibly be the final stage. And we're definitely going to talk about this. The other thing that's interesting is, and let me just go back a second here. Um, and I didn't really, I didn't really talk about this. I didn't, I didn't get this on a bullet point here, but I forgot. But um, naturals in any skill, there are people who are just born naturals for whatever reason, and I, I don't really have a theory as to why that's so. But um, people just have certain natural gifts, and the difference between a natural and someone who's taking on a skill for which they're not a natural is that naturals do this task backwards. Um, so a natural starts off with the connections and then learns the techniques. So someone like a Robin Williams probably was born a natural. He probably started at, at a very, very almost, you know, you know, almost as a kid, you know, noticing the connection between one thing and another. He may not have had the ability to do a, a German voice and a Japanese voice and a, and, a South and a South African voice or anything that he might need. He, he might have learned those later, but I'm pretty sure that he got that, you know, he got the timing and how things connect probably from the very, very, very beginning. And what's interesting about that is that even though we're, we may not be a natural at something that we want to, to master, we can, we can take a cue from that and we can p take a peek at the end. We can take a peek at the end and say, okay, what are the naturals doing that's different than what I'm doing? At least I have a vision for what it's supposed to look like. And when, it, when, when I was doing software, I started looking at frameworks. Um, and even, even, even as I was looking here, and even as I started here, I was, I was looking there, starting really on, in a way from there. And I'm going to make that obvious in a second. So let's jump forward. OK. All right, let, let's give an example here. Um, 
So as he mentioned, I, I held the world record for the Rubik's Cube back in, back in the day, as they say, 1981, when it was the, when it was the hot puzzle. Um, the problem with the Rubik's Cube, and the, the reason that people are so perplexed by it, is because the parts are so dependent on one another. So if you look at the different stages of mastery, and you talk about how things are randomly connected, nothing is more randomly connected than a scrambled Rubik's Cube. Um, so I don't know if this is going to fly on the camera here. Is that the camera right there? So I'm going to try and do this so people can see. I'm going to show you just one move on the Rubik's Cube, okay? just so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so the problem with the puzzle, so let's take an example. Let's say I have this red piece right here, okay? So if I take this red piece out, so this red piece is sitting over here. If I want to take this red piece and I want to complete the side, so I want to move this piece over here, you know, obviously I can turn the piece here and then move it up. That would be the shortest path to getting it up here. The problem is, is that by moving this piece up, I've scrambled, I've moved these pieces out of the way. So turning just, there's eight corners on the cube. Turning just one side turns half of all of the corners on the cube. Um, and obviously, turning one side is kind of trivial. It's not going to get me anywhere. To do pretty much much of anything, I have to turn at least one side and at least one other. So I'm moving six of the eight corners um, before I can do anything useful. So pretty much everything is in motion all the time, and that's why people struggle with it. So let me give you an example of how we can separate the pieces out so that um, instead of being totally dependent on one another, we can perform some limited actions where the pieces act completely independently. So if you think about it, the, the Rubik's Cube, most people like to think in terms of sides, but that's actually a mistake. It, it's better to think in terms of the pieces. So there's corner pieces and there's edge pieces. The center pieces never move. A lot of people don't realize that, but the center pieces really never move. But I won't get into, I won't get into explain. Let's just, assume, let's just assume that, okay? And really, if I had just these four moves where I have the X's, I could solve the whole puzzle. If I could move any corner wherever I wanted it to be, if I could move any edge wherever I wanted it to be, and then once they're in places, I might need to rotate them. I need to orient them or flip them around. If I could flip any corner or flip any edge, then, um, then boom, I could solve the whole puzzle. The problem is it's very difficult to do any of these moves without pretty much scrambling all the pieces on the cube. So let me give you an example of a, of a move, okay? Let's look at this state a second, okay? In this state, everything from here down is totally solved, okay? We're going to work on this one just because it's the easiest one to do, okay? It's the easiest one to, to visualize, okay? We're going to work on flipping an edge, okay? So everything from here down is perfectly solved. And I have to flip this piece around. This piece is in the right position. It's the red and white edge. I just have to take it out and turn it around, okay? Same with this yellow one. I have to be able to take this one out and turn it around. Now, how can I do that without scrambling it. If I could perform these moves independently, if I could, for example, just switch two corners or just flip some edges, then I could move the pieces into position kind of one at a time. Does that make sense? I wouldn't have to, I'm just trying to remove the dependence on So watch this a second, okay? Just follow this red piece. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this, I'm going to separate this red from the, the red edge from the red corners by moving it out here, okay? Then I'm going to take these red and move them around to the back. And then this red can slide from front to back. So that's the way I'm going to reconnect these pieces. Okay? Not a very long move. You don't necessarily have to get the move. But just understand that I've just done a very short, simple move to just take this piece out and reconnect it. The problem is that in doing so, I've pretty much scrambled the entire puzzle. And that's where people get stuck. So in an attempt to, to do what I'm talking about here, which is to make the pieces independent of one another, we have to be able to overcome that. So how can I then solve? How can I restore the bottom of the cube? Does anybody want to take a, take a guess at it? I'll give you a clue. I was just there a second ago. This was just, the bottom of the puzzle was just perfect just a second ago. No? Okay, good. <laughs> um, well, if I reverse every single thing I just did, then the bottom would be restored. Now, on the surface, that seems trivial because, of course, then that would end up unflipping this piece that we just did all this work to flip. But... The move I just performed had no effect on the top side other than on this one piece. Therefore, if I were to turn this piece into this position, and there's no collateral damage over here, I've just switched which piece is going to get the unflip part. And now I reverse all the moves I just did. So I move this to the back, and I move the piece out to the front. All this is is the reverse of the move I just did. Then boom, the bottom is restored, and then the top is solved. I just move this piece back. So boom, I've just done this one piece. Instead of, 
you know, really, instead of having the pieces be dependent on one another, I've essentially created a way to do just a very small action without, without a lot of collateral damage. Does that make sense? And I could just easily walk through all four of these moves. Um, the, the corner is essentially the exact, flipping the corner is exactly the same, except one goes clockwise and the other counterclockwise, which makes total sense. And believe it or not, moving the pieces is even a shorter move. Um, but uh, it's actually just part of the move we just saw, so it's even shorter. But I won't walk through them because I don't think it makes good uh, TV here. But, uh, but you get the point. If you could do these four things, if you could separate your, 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 your overall randomness into just, into just these four components, um, all of which, by the way, based on that same principle, which is I'm doing something forward and I'm doing something reverse. So essentially one single concept, one single move, really, um, can solve the whole puzzle. So how does this help me in the pizza business? How does all this separation help me in the pizza business? Well, just, I'll just give one little simple example. Um, when I moved from my home kitchen into the commercial kitchen, um, I change the way that I store my dough. So most people, if you go into pizzerias, they'll, they'll have these trays. They'll have a tray. And in the tray, there'll be a spot for six or eight different dough balls. And the trays will stack up, and uh, they'll have a couple of hundred dough balls in there. And as they're making pizza, they take a tray out, and they scoop up one dough ball, and that's the one they're making. The problem is, is that if I take the lid off of, the, take a lid off of a tray to pull out dough ball number one, and then I don't have to make another pizza for another five or ten minutes, well, then dough balls two through six are drying out. So that they're, one pizza it becomes dependent on the next. So um, I made the decision very early on to put all the dough balls into separate containers just so that they would have their own individual life cycle. And as soon as I, as soon as I, I thought of that, um, you know, it immediately... You know, it, it, it immediately just fit, it fits into this. You know what I'm saying? Mentally for me, I was, I was sure. I was like, oh, is this going to be the right move for me? Because it would seem like a lot of extra work. And it is a little bit of extra work. But of course, I knew it was the right thing because anything like that, is, I know, is this, any sort of a separation is an advance over. I mean, how random is it? We talk about things being randomly connected. Pizza 1 is now randomly connected to Pizza 6, which could come at any time. depends on when some random person comes through the door. You can see how these things collide with one another. And by separating things out, I, 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 make, I go a long way to preventing that. Um, similarly, we have one big pizza oven right now. And with one big pizza oven, um, every pie you put in affects the pie right next to it. So if I put in a pizza pie on one, one slot, then the next pie that goes in right after that, uh, the, the stone that it's sitting on is cooler because the pie, pie number one, took all the heat off of that stone. So again, similar sort of a situation. All right, let me talk now. I'm gonna, now I'm going to go into the software aspect of this, and I'm, I'm going to uh, try and relate all this. So, um, like I said, I started doing, um, I started dealing with databases, a lot of different vertical applications. And I immediately noticed that a lot of these, these legacy systems that I came upon, and even systems that were being developed new, were being programmed in uh, a, a semi-random way, to be honest with you. So. Just, I'll give an example here. So let's say that I have uh, a sales screen. So I've got a little order processing screen where someone can, you know, I've got a warehouse full of stuff, and I've got a you know, person on the phone taking calls from customers, and they get a call, and they're going to punch in you know, um, an order for product X, and it's going to come out of the warehouse, and it's going to go to my customer. And so let's say behind the screen there are 10 pages of code to do all the management behind the screen. Well, very quickly we'd realize, well, we don't just have that one task. We're not just selling things. We also are doing repairs. So repairs are a little different. We're pulling items back from customers, and they're going into a different location. Um, they're still part of our inventory. You know, we can't let things get stolen. We still got to know where they are, but they're going to a different sort of a pot. Blah, 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 blah. Some things are the same. Some things are different. So for example, sales might have sales tax, whereas repairs don't have sales tax. Uh, both have a shipping address. So some of them things are similar, and some things are not so similar. So we see that there's variations on that theme. And in addition to repairs, I might do service orders, which don't have physical goods, but maybe judged by the hour. I'm doing contract work, which are fixed prices, whatever. So I have a variety of different tasks. And I immediately noticed that a lot of the way these things were programmed in the real world were people would take the 10 pages of code and found it difficult to figure out how to get all those to coexist without these big branching case statements. So instead, they would really just separate the screens. So they end up with a sales screen and a separate screen for repairs and separate for service and contract. Next up, I noticed that there were different audiences looking 
um, looking at that order. So the customer service rep is looking at the order, then the salesman may want to go online and look at the order, the guy in the factory may be looking at inventory aspects of, this, of, of that order, and then the customer themselves is going, to get some, is going to get a copy of the order, either in an email or a printout or something. But each of these might be seeing something slightly different. For example, the customer service rep on his screen, he might see a credit score come up for that customer or a credit limit or something like that. Well, the salesman might see that, but the guy in the factory probably shouldn't see that. And the guy in the factory might see inventory information that you don't necessarily want your sales guys to, to be privy to. So, um, so each person is looking at a slight variation on this, on this order, and they're doing it not just for the sale, but for all of these. And then in addition to that, we have different outputs. So some people are seeing things to the screen, others to the printer. You know, the guys in accounting want everything dumpable to Excel. You might have an HTML version. So you end up with a lot of versions. And in the real world, what I saw was code exploding. Um, I, I've seen companies that had pretty, like a, a simple company that I saw that had a, had a uh, um, they sold like packaging, like the, the plastic that you can't cut off when you, buy, when you buy a tool. They sold that sort of packaging. And they had 135,000 pages of code, 8 million lines of code, running their order processing and inventory systems. And this is why. Okay. And so, of course, that's just the sales module. Then you have all these other modules. You have distribution and receiving, and you have finance, and you have the customer uh, themselves, and HR, and manufacturing, and purchasing, and inventory. You have all these different modules, many of which oftentimes are coded by separate people. Um, what will happen is you'll get, a, you'll, you'll get a, you know, one of these big firms, an accounting firm. I don't want to name any names, but <laughs> you all know who you are, um, who will come to you, and they'll say, Oh, you want inventory? We have inventory, and they'll show you an inventory module that was coded by somebody who doesn't work there anymore. And you want purchasing? We do. We have a purchasing module. I'm going to show you this other module. They don't mention the fact that they're coded totally separately. And all we have all everything you need. All we have to do is reconnect them. Of course, it's in the reconnecting of them that you end up with this with this mess that I call the Frankenstein model, which is really my example in this in this in this presentation of things that are really truly randomly connected. Okay. Um, so what was the solution to this? So what, was, what, what solutions were proposed? Well, I saw a lot of people gravitating toward these toolkits. So a toolkit like something like a power builder. This is early on. Um, um, let's take something like a power builder. So a power builder, you know, in, if, you, if you just were to um, use a rough tool like just C++ or something like that, then you really would have, you'd have no tools available. So you'd be just doing everything from scratch. So people coded these toolkits something like a power builder, where they took all these data management tools and tried to encapsulate them into, um, into different little toolboxes that you could use. So for example, there would be SQL query tools. There would be a tool for drawing tables. There would be reporting tools. But you know, they didn't get it all. And so what ended up happening was that you know, as, as, as these things were coded, as individual modules were coded, there was a lot that wasn't, wasn't up here. And so you'd end up seeing a lot of code down here. So for example, if you're if you're typing in the name of a customer, you've got to look up that customer to make sure that you know you, you might just type you know if you're typing in Google, you just might type G O O and you hope that it's going to find Google. So you have to do a lookup. So is that done on your individual screen? Well, a lot of times it was. You know, and then the guy in the inventory might need to do the same thing for a product, and the guy over here might need to do the same thing for something else. So you would see that there's a lot of duplication of effort down here. But then over time. You know, people would take the best of these, would be put into a separate little toolkit that'd be sold as a separate product, and eventually a lot of these end up getting rolled into the product itself. But what you still have at this point in time um, is a bunch of separate tools um, um, that do not interconnect in a powerful way. Okay. Okay. So I I knew instinctively at this point, observing this over and over and over again in multi-million dollar projects. That there were just that this wasn't the answer. That there was another level or another phase of this. Okay, let's look at this screen for a second. I'm going to begin to break it down. So this is a very very typical you know data view screen. So this is a screen of order items. So we've had a whole bunch of people order a bunch of stuff, and so you know here I have order number one, and here I have order items about order number two, and order order number three, and these are the individual line items within that. So we see the name of the customer, the order item. The product codes, the product description, the size, you see the prices. You see all these different things. Okay? And this would be coded, back in the old days, this would be coded um, one off by a developer. So if you wanted to screen look at this, you had to have a developer that would actually um, code something like this. So he, he would get a search tool. So built into these toolkits, you'd see a search tool. So at least he's not 
you know, connecting, creating his own connection to the database. He's got a tool to do that, but he's got to write a lot of code. So he, he calls his search tool and he puts in his query and then he initiates some sort of a grid tool and then he goes through all the data, all the different rows and takes individual pieces of data out of his query and pushes, pushes them into the grid and at the end he goes column by column and he, he specifies what formatting. So for example, the currency is going to be formatted and he gives, the, he, gives the, he gives the formatting that he wants to see displayed for the, for the currency. And so this is what you would see kind of at this, at this, at this middle level of how, of how data would be, would be displayed. Okay? But I knew when I was looking at this situation that this left a lot of room to be desired because once the data was pushed into this table, there wasn't a whole lot you could do with it other than manipulate the data that was actually here. So for example, let's say that I have um, a, a product code over here. Well, my actual join to this product table is not through a code or through the description, but is through some sort of a secret you know, hidden key number. Well, that's not wasn't put on this screen because we, it wasn't part of the display. So essentially, you couldn't do a join from here. You could, there was no interface, for example, for a user to do a join from this point in time. Um, um, you'd even have problems at this point doing, um, well, I won't talk about that. Let's take more topic. Okay. So anyway, I noticed that there were, that, that there were a, at, even though this has a certain degree of complexity, I noticed that there was a lot more complexity in a lot of things in computers that were being handled a lot better. So if computers really are all about handling variations, if you think about it, so I have different image formats, JPEGs, GIFs, PNGs. I have different video formats. I have different types of data, foreign keys, money, dates, images, barcodes. You know, I have different um, um, GUI controls. I have check boxes and radio buttons and sliders and scroll boxes and combo boxes, menus, pull downs and pop ups. I have all these different. So it, computers, one way to think about computers is it's, it's, it's just taking vast amounts of variations and um, and getting them all to work together. Well, there's a formula for, for making these things work together that really is what makes them into plug and play. So plug and play itself has a formula. And what you see is that these end up getting, these variations end up getting bundled together and being dealt with via the construction of frameworks. And that frameworks have very, very specific, a very, very specific architecture. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a very specific architecture that I call a mature framework. And a lot of times what you'll see is a mature framework will start off as an immature framework. So that power builder, like what I was talking about, where, where you would start with a tool, you would start with a tool down at the leaves, and then they would work their way up to the core eventually. That's really the beginnings of a, of a framework, but it's really not a mature framework. By the time you get into handling this the way the operating system does, it ends up having a very, very specific structure. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the elements of data, the different output methods, those different tasks, the different audiences. These were the three I saw in the Rubik's Cube, um, and, and, and then many others. And I wanted to roll them into a framework, and I knew that the framework, if it was properly structured, would reconnect these and that that reconnection is what creates that level of mastery. It's, it's creating these so that they powerfully interconnect. So let's talk about this for a second. It's a little backwards, but. Okay, so what is the difference between the f doing things in a framework versus doing things with tools? So let's say, for example, the operating system, something for which we're probably all most familiar. So um, the operating system deals with a lot of different things, but I think the two primary, it could be argued that the two primary things it deals with are threads and windows. So it has a lot of other things like fonts and, and all different kinds of hardware stuff, but the primary thing you, you could make a case is it deals with HWINS, it deals with windows, and it deals with, with threads. And I want to talk, for example, about windows as a, good, as a good example. So you don't own your own windows. All the windows are just data that is registered with the operating system. So you might have a wrapper, if you're coding in C++, you might have a CWIND or something, you might have a wrapper around your HWIND. But basically, all that is, is, um, is a pointer or a handle to the operating system's version of your, of your HWIND. So um, the, the benefit of that is that nothing happens to that HWIND outside of, you know, that the operating system doesn't know about. You don't have access to the HWIND to change a variable that might be contained in the HWIND structure. You can't move it to a new position. There's an API call that somebody else wrote that, that, that the same person that's responsible for the operating system wrote, 
and they'll move it for you. So you can you can make a request to move it, but and then they will change their own data and then do all the house housekeeping associated with that, and that's how things happen. And um, that's why you can, for example, log onto a machine and change your themes. Even though you have like 10 programs running, you can change the theme of the bars on the windows because the operating system really owns all the windows, doesn't matter what program is running. Okay. So what you end up with then is um, an API. You end up with the operating system holding these tables of registered objects, and you end up with a bunch of APIs that you can call that will, will modify these. And then if you're operating at this level, what you get instead of holding your data is you get events pumped down to you. So the events are pumped down to you. If you want to respond to an event, you have to make an API call, which then affects the data. And then the API call does whatever cleanup is necessary to run at this stage. Okay? Let me blow this out in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Actually, let me do this slide a second. Okay, so here's, 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 here's a kind of a blowout of one of those layers, okay? Okay, so this is, a, this, is a, this is a framework layer. So this is my layer, and I now own all the data. So instead of, for example, creating a tool for you to search on data, and then another tool for you to display your data, like we were doing in that, in that, in that list of order items, instead, I'm going to create a framework where the framework is going to own all the data. So you can make a request to create a data, con a list container, for example, a table container. And then you can pass a query, a select clause, to that container. And then you can um, um, make changes to the container by, by, by having an API call that would, that would make a change to the size or the number of rows or anything in that container. But basically, the level above you really owns the container. The framework owns the container, and everything you do is really at its permission. So over here, you have um, an API-managed list of data. So this could be HWINS if you're an operating system. It could be database tables. It could be pointers to records on the database if we're at the level that I was talking about. Then over here, we have all the toolkits that um, you can call to change the data that's being held by the container. And um, we can modify these in some way, several ways. So here, for example, we have, a, we have suite, num suite A. And what I can do is I can I'm just going to dance a little bit. I can I can make an addendum onto that. So maybe maybe that maybe when a message comes down here, the 99% of the time I let the default handler handle it, and the default handler calls back this suite. Or maybe I'm going to make one little addition to it. So I can change this layer, and I can either do it down here. I can make my code change down here directly, or possibly I can go over here and change the handler and make an addendum to the tool itself so that it can handle it for all the layers that get created down here. So for example, if I am um, wanted to do lookups a certain way that was maybe a slight modification on the way that the, the framework did lookups, I could go over here and create a generic lookup manager that would apply to all the screens that I've created. Um, and that, that, would get its call, that would get its call as the default handler and then would pass the bulk of the work down to the handler below it. Or I could completely substitute a tool if I wanted to. We see this in the operating system. This is what started up things are all about. You, know, you have all these different, different uh, um, uh, you know, if you think of these as different components of the operating system, when you start up, you, you add on to certain components. You change, you change or swap out certain components. Um, let's see. Go back a layer here a second. Okay. Okay. So um, in addition to having the operating system or having your framework layer handle the data, it also handles lists of functions. I mean, is there a whiteboard in here, or it's not? It's OK. Um, I noticed a long time ago that a lot of people want to code things in hierarchies. And hierarchies, where essentially you have hierarchies of, if you look at an object oriented an object, you have data and function. That's the essence of each object, is you have a bundle of data, and then you have the functions that go with it. The problem is, is a lot of times you really want mul some sort of multiple inheritance, where you know, I might have a data object here, and then I might have two children, and then I want to have a data object here that pulls both from this and from this, especially a lot of times the functionality. So what ends up happening is you end up taking that functionality off, and you end up putting it on lists. And that's really what this is. This is, this is an API mesh function. So give me, let me give you an example. Um, let's say that I right mouse click on a file on my desktop. Well, a menu pops up where I can do 
I can search, if it's a folder, I can search on it. But maybe I've added functions that didn't exist in the operating system. So maybe I have a backup function. I'm using Carbonite or something, so I can set the Carbonite settings. Or I'm using um, SVN Tortoise or one of these, uh, or one of these sorts of things that, that, that will sync my files with something else. Where does that code, where is, where is that code? You know, when I write mouse click, how does it know that Carbonite can affect that file? Well, essentially, the operating system has lists of functions that can apply when you right mouse click on something. And you can add your list. It might start, off, start you off with a list, and then you can add your own items to the list. And you don't just provide the code. Oftentimes, there's a whole table of parameters that goes with that, that's telling the operating system when and where that code can be used, so that a lot of it gets managed without having to be any, any interaction with the code itself. Um, let's see. Let me go back a slide. I'm locked in this. I'm locked in this little thing here. Must be one of these. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's see what that would look like for our screen. Okay. So let's see what that looks like for the screen. So before the screen, there was a whole bunch of code. Okay. And that code was. It was semi-random in the sense that the guy who wrote that code might not even be here anymore, as I, as I, as I, as I keep giving that as an example. Um, and in order to modify that code, we'd have to actually go into the code, crack the code, read the code, compile the code, etc. Here's another way of constructing the screen, really without a whole lot of code. Instead, the, 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 the screen is going to be created by the framework which interconnects all the parts. So over here, for example, we have a column registry. So here, for example, we have an order item um, SKU.ID. So that, that's the name, of a, that's the name of, of a column. And we can see that that's a foreign key, that that points to the SKU, to our product. Um, and this is the specific column. This is the name of the column. This is order item dot SKU ID, and this is the column that it points to, which is SKU.ID. Okay? Then over here we have another order, we have an order item that has a unit price, and that unit price is, is going to be handled by a code, by, by, by an object called currency. And then I have an order item called total price, and this is also managed by currency, but unlike the unit price, this one is summable. So if I had a list of unit prices, I wouldn't want to see them summed, but if you have a list of total prices, I might. So basically, the framework sets out what it's willing to handle and what it's, willing, and what it's not willing to handle. So it creates a standard by which all the people that come next, all the, all the users of the framework, um, know what information is needed. Then over here, I have a table registry. So here I've defined my product, my SKU, and I've said its ID column is ID. The code handler is the default one for handling tables. And then over here, just to give an example of a column that I might have on this table, is that I'm saying that the default join, anytime someone joins over to this column table, they probably really want to see, see not, just the, not, just the, the, not just the ID, but they probably want to see the style code, the style name, and the size. So if you see over here, and it is color coded, but you probably can't see in the screen, that these three columns, the product code, the style name, and the, and the size, all all exist here, and they're all kind of sort of colored together, and you probably can't see that. But then over here, I have a registry for the view. So that's what actually creates this. So I've registered this view. It's table is order item. It's just given a name. It's given the default handler, and then I have a select clause. But within the select clause, oops, a daisy. Okay. All right. So anyway, so the currency obviously is going to be applied to the unit price in the select clause. And then this default join is going to be applied over here. So that all I'm saying is I want the default, and then it will build this, it will build and construct this view for me. So there's no coding involved. Everything is handled in an interconnected way through a series of framework code which can loop through these lists of information. If you compare this, for example, to the code that had to be written before to create the exact same screen, which is here somewhere. You can see this was an awful lot of uneditable code, whereas the other thing was, was whereas, whereas with the framework, everything is totally generic. And yet you have the same functionality. But now you can go beyond this functionality. Let me give you an example of where you're going to go beyond the functionality. So I always talk about how in the, in the last stage of mastery where things are powerfully connected, you have the ability to improvise. So I talked about Robin Williams improvising or Tiger Woods improvising. Let's look at how this can create, help, help you improvise. So let's see, what do I have? Is this the screen? OK. So because this screen now, this is the same screen. Because this screen 
um, is not owned by the person that programmed it, but rather is simply something that's registered with a framework, the framework can now manipulate it in a, in a, in a, in a powerful way. In fact, I could write, I could have written this whole function that I'm about to do after the guy that wrote the screen doesn't even work here anymore. I can add functionality to a thousand back, I can make it backwards compatible with a thousand old screens because I haven't, I'm not really asking for much new information. Uh, I'm certainly not asking for any new code to be written. So as part of this little demo thing, what I did was I created a new table called a reward program. So we've got our customers and we want to divide them into, you know, gold, you know, gold, platinum, or silver rewards or something like that. So just prior to this screen running, this table was created. So it didn't even exist. The table, the rewards table, um, didn't exist 10 minutes before this demo, and nor did the field called company.rewardsprogram. So there's another, this is the table, the table that we're looking at here is the company table, and then the reward program is a point, reward program ID is a pointer onto yet another table. So essentially, we're, if we were starting on the order item table, we're two joins away from seeing the word gold or platinum. Does that make sense? Okay. But what I've done here is now I've provided a completely generic interface to bring up a table like this that will let me drill in to, um, to, to these things that have a relation, to these columns that have a relation. And now we're going to select the reward program. And in fact, we've selected two columns. We've selected the reward program and we've selected that we also want to compare the reward program versus the type of the, of the product. So we originally had the product code, style, and name, but we really weren't seeing the type of the product, whether it's an earring or whether it's a necklace or anything like that. So I specified that I want to see both the reward program and the type. And then I hit this little button over here called the pen columns, and it can go back through this data table that it owns. It's owned by the framework, and it can go back find all the hidden data that's behind here that it managed because it's the one that does the queries in the first place. So it always makes sure that the data it needs is available um, and stored. And then it goes back and pulls up those additional columns that didn't exist a minute ago. Now we can actually run yet another function on this, which is we can actually run a summary. So there were hundreds of rows. There were 207 rows behind me. So um, nine of those were um, silver pins. And then a subtotal. Then you have a subtotals of all the different items that all the different columns that specify themselves as having the summable characteristic. Does that make sense? And then you can continue on to hit a button called Show Detail, where you could then actually highlight the columns that you're interested in, and then it would it would then pull the detail up from the summary. So to actually have coded this on an individual screen, which was being done before when you had a toolkit was basically impossible. No one was going to code all of this functionality um, into, into it using raw toolbox tools. But as a framework where things are managed at a higher level, that's what, that, that this is the kind of sort of thing that becomes possible. Is that, this is making sense? So the interesting thing about this, though, for me, from, from what I'm trying to project, is that when I was dealing with the, the individual tools to construct things like this, I was very cognizant because of the mastery principles that um, I, I had an idea of what it would look like before, and I could compare it. I, 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 could, I, could find, I could find things that I had done or things that I was proposing and then compare them and say, is this going to create a way for people to generically edit this at the end? Have we handled all the exceptions that we need to handle? Have we handled all the rules that we need to handle? Um, you know, is the, are the boundaries or the layers between the way things connect properly structured? And if you can answer yes to those, then you're going in the right direction. If you can't, and you're still kind of building tools, and you just know you're not at the right stage, and you don't want to code yourself into a corner, which I've seen a lot of, a lot of times happen. Does that make sense? So anyway, so that's the point. That's basically what I wanted to talk about today, um, just to give a little flavor. And now we end with a picture of pizza, and that's it. <laughs> so that's it. Any questions? Is that more than you thought you were getting out of pizza? <laughs> yeah, I'll give an example. So, um, um, when when you are when you're doing something that's not um, when you're at the early stages and you make a mistake early, you can't self-correct. There's really, you don't have the school tools or skills to do that. And 
my pizza is really good when I make it myself at home in a very controlled situation. Opening the restaurant's a whole nother level. It's a whole nother ball of wax. Uh, we've got a lot of people touching the dough. The dough goes through, you know, a, a two-day cycle, and there's a lot of, you know, no one works two days straight, so there's so different people working on every little aspect of this. And so while we, while we try to get things right the first time, of course, uh, there is that understanding that that's not, real, that's not really possible at the stage that we're at right now, you know, and it may never be possible. So we have to be, have, we have to be more flexible so that we can correct situations later. A lot of pizzerias, they don't really care. They, 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 they fix this problem because they don't really care what the dough tastes like, so they just they make the dough, and then two hours later, they can use the dough. We age the dough for a long period of time, which creates all these different potential problems. So, um, so um, you know, we, we've had a variety of breakdowns, and sometimes what I've done is I've simulated breakdowns so that people can learn how to recover from certain situations. So. Um, we had a situation, for example, where um, the dough was overproofed and it was just warmed too long. It was kept in a, in a warm, the air conditioning didn't work properly or it was kept in a warm spot or whatever. And so um, now we need to learn how to stretch dough that wasn't, that wasn't ideal. And um, um, that could be a train wreck <laughs> if you have customers coming, if you have customers in the, coming in the door. So some of the things that we've done is we've actually simulated that in advance so that we could look for processes at every stage of the game, saying, okay, how can we correct horrible dough? Is there something we can do with horrible dough? And it turns out that if you, you know, it becomes very hard to stretch and it gets holes in it, but if you warm the dough, if you microwave every single dough, for example, then it becomes a lot easier to stretch. If you pre-examine every, if you take the dough and kind of triage the dough and look underneath it, you can see the beginnings of holes forming and you can get rid of those early in the day before, you know, customers start arriving in mass. So there's a variety of just kind of sort of pushing yourself, pushing yourself to the next level things because you know that you're going to experience this. And in, and in some days, honestly, it, 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 it's not helpful, but it's just comforting to know that that this is part of the process, that part of the process is it works one day and it doesn't work the next. And it doesn't matter whether it's software, it doesn't matter whether it's golf, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's pizza. It's just that's the process that you're going through and that there's a lot of time involved, you know. I mean, another thing that it, it helps with really is, is just um, going deeper, I think, than most people will into the ingredients of the example I gave. Uh, you know, we're just continually testing things. A lot of people, they get a they get, a, um, they get a, a, a tomato from a supplier and then that's it. We know that every batch that comes in might be a little different, that every season of tomatoes is a little different than the season before, that we have to, that we have to look at the batch codes and notice these, these, these sorts of things, breaking things into finer and finer distinctions. <laughs> right. Yes. No, no, definitely not. Oh, no, absolutely not. I mean, I've only been at it for a few months. Um, and, um, um, you know, and, and Massey Mastery is a process, though. So let me, let me talk a little bit about this just for a second, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, Jeff, you're a perfectionist. But it's actually perfectionism and mastery are almost opposite, if you think about it. Perfectionist both look the same because they might be trying to get to a specific point. But a perfectionist is really someone who's kind of emotionally attached to things being one way. A, ma a, a perfectionist never looks like he's in control. He's always stressed out because things are not the way they're supposed to be. It's almost the opposite of a master who looks cool and collected, you know, even when things are changing around him. Does that make sense? So, like, you know, the example I always give is, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, James Bond. You know, he's he's we were fascinated by looking at masters because it's um, the more you because they can do anything, and because the, 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 the more, e even in odd situations, and the more you look at it, the, the, the more depth you see in it. So, you know, James Bond, you know, there's an alligator coming at him, he looks around, you know, and he, he can kill it with a bobby pin and a raisin. 
you know, somehow, somehow he can he can like figure out how to make that how to make that make make it work. He's not trying to pre-plan everything. He's just walking through the situation and taking what comes. You see this with you know with Louis Armstrong. If you listen to Louis Armstrong play the trumpet, which I highly recommend, you know, a true master, at, you know, of of the 20th century. And you listen to it. You can listen to it a hundred times. You're like, how? how did how did he do that exactly? Or how did he know that that exact timing? You know, when Frank Sinatra waits a little extra second to, to sing that note and is off timing, it sounds perfect. When you and I do it, it just sounds like, like crap. So, <laughs> so, it, um, so how does that, how does that, how does that happen? You know, they're not trying to sit there and make it work one particular way. Instead, they have this power to, 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 to improvise based on how everything is happening. Louis Armstrong used to just let guys in the band just riff, and then he would just riff off of that. You know, just like Robin Williams does with the audience. And in a way, that's the whole point, really, of, of this exercise, is that this summary, this sort of summary data, is an improvised thing. Um, and, um, uh, you know, which isn't possible at, 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 you know, trying to get everything just right. This is why, in a way, you know, one of the things I had on the, on the, little, the little chart was I talked about the... Uh, the, the very first chart where I, t where I talked about the different stages is I, is I had the economy. You know, a planned economy, you know, is, is perfectionism, is utopianism, is trying to get everything just right. You can't get everything just right. You know, whereas a, whereas a free market is is is, is self-correcting, um, and um, um, because there's thousands of people looking at individual prices, you know, all the time, the price becomes the the interconnecting part that connects all the different aspects of the economy. Almost any time, therefore, you engage in price fixing to distort prices in some way, which is what you do in a planned economy, it's just a series of one type of price fix after another, you know, things never really work out. You know, even something looks like it's a cap, it's a free market capitalist, if it's, if it's heavily regulated or heavily, heavily price fixed, then, you know, then, then, it, then, it, then it won't be flexible, you know. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're learning. <laughs> That's all I can say. What's that? Well, you know, we no, we have, you know, we have our processes like any business does. You know, when I make decide I'm going to make a change, I write it down. I have a, I have a list of all the employees. They have to, you know, they, they if I decide that this is that the, the, the specification on a weighted cheese is going from 130 grams to 150, then, you know, I, I literally have every person in the kitchen have to sign off on that. So that, because we did have problems early on where people were like, well, I didn't, you told hey, this person, but not this person. So we do these, you know, with these simple things. Not everyone works every shift, so it's hard to communicate. So we just do, you know, written, written sort of processes. But, you know, I'd be lying if I said that, we, you know, we are at stage three. We are, we are not at stage three. We are absolutely positively at stage two. And even when you're at stage three, you continue. Stage two never really end, but, but, but you, there is some sort of a shift at some point where you can see that you've hit stage three. I mean, this sort of programming is clearly, you know, at a different level than just building, than just building a screen would be and just hoping, you know. I mean, I look at this all the time. I, I was on my, I'm on my bank screen all the time. I reconcile my bank book every day. Um, and, um, um, you know, all, all my check registers on the bank, you know, is all in HTML. You can't even copy it into a spreadsheet without the tabs going on, <laughs> you know, without the, with the, the things wrapping and all this other, all this other stuff. So, you know, um, Clearly, you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a dearth of thinking about how that can be usable in, in an improv situation, in multiple situations. You know, there's just, the tools haven't been constructed or haven't been utilized properly to to allow. For, I mean, we're a long way from being able to highlight three checks and and comparing them to the to, the, to checks to the same vendors at another time. Like that would be a feature I would love. You know, click a check and then it would know. You know, everybody everybody else. Uh, you know, that I sent that check to. Um, you know, subtotaled, and maybe not just even one, but maybe multiple checks so I could see things in a, in a group. If I highlight all my cheese vendors that I pay through through the computer that actually are paid on the, my bank's website, if I could highlight, you know, three checks and say I want to see all the checks that match the vendor on this check, you know, they don't have that. They're not, you know, this is, this is with this, that's easy. You know, that's, it's, easy. it's easy to say, for example, that I want to highlight, you know, um, this necklace. And then I want to right mouse click and have it highlight all the other necklaces. You know, that, that's a function that could be built generically 
but it can't be built generically um, if, um, if what you've displayed doesn't contain all the information. All the information has been put into display, and there's nothing behind it in, a, in some sort of a framework. Does that make sense? Anybody else? Well, you guys got to come and taste the pizza. That's the bottom line. So, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, I think I think uh, Mike was talking about that. So uh, that would be, that would be great. We're gonna do a little uh, pizza and beer thing. We've done a lot of these tastings, and uh, and that's an interesting thing too because you know we we did tasting for example with a, with a beer vendor, and um, um, they had like 40 people come, and they had six beers, and they had us pair of the beers. And they said it was like the best one they'd ever done. Like, we, we just opened. We shouldn't be the best one they've done in years, you know. There's always other restaurants. But one thing that we have that a lot of other guys don't have is we just taste everything. So it just, you know, sensitizes our palate. So, like, just the fact that we've tasted 28 oreganos and over 50 tomatoes and, you know, and over 50 kinds of cheese and over almost 100 types of olive oil gives us a little bit of a different palate. And we have an ability to mix and match things in a, in a way. And, and even to create, we, had, we actually created a couple pizzas that didn't match beers, didn't match any of the things we had in the menu. We were able to create and mix and match certain things uh, between Heather and I because we have, um, have built up those techniques and have that, that, that more defined of a palette. And definition is all about separation. What's that? She's got a good beer palette. Maybe your belly, maybe? <laughs> Anything else, guys? Sure, absolutely. <laughs>